Well, thank you very much for coming tonight and for inviting me to talk. Um, it's with mixed emotions that I do so. Um, it's important that we mark this anniversary. Um, as Patricia was saying, it's uh, one of the great atrocities of our time. It's just sad that because of everything else that's happened in Iraq and elsewhere in the Middle East, the date and the event of Halabja and the Anfal campaign um, seems to be um, leaving the collective memory. And it's um, important, I think, the, the work that Bayan has been doing in raising this petition to have what happened there recognized as a genocide and to push back the impression that it was a great idea to leave Saddam Hussein and his sons in power. I know that's a controversial position to have, but after Halabja, I, for one, was not going to go to Hyde Park and say, leave Saddam in place. Um, so um, that's my own personal um, opinion. Um, I thought maybe, um, since I see there's quite a lot of young people in the audience, so it might just be worth reminding people what global diplomacy and politics was like in 1988. Of course, the Cold War was still on. Gorbachev had come to power in, at the Kremlin, but the world was still very much fixated by um, the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, it manifested itself, obviously, in lots of the proxy wars we saw being fought out um, across mainly the third world countries. But there were also conflicts, like the Iran-Iraq war, um, which defied the system uh, that was in place globally. Um, and in the case of that particular conflict, it was a deeply cynical, bloody, and um, uh, I suppose cynical really is the, is the best uh, adjective to use for it. Um, and what was clear as the conflict went on was that the global powers were absolutely delighted to have what the economists called two four-letter countries battling it out um, at the cost of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, um, spending their money on arms and ending up nearly a decade after the war started exactly where they were previously, except battered, bruised, broke, um, and um, uh, some countries armed both sides, some countries armed one side, even though there was an arms embargo. Um, nobody came out of this conflict um, looking good. And uh, we were just discussing upstairs now um, about, um, you know, the investigations really never got to the bottom of who supplied Saddam with um, the chemicals that enable him to, to build up his arsenal, um, who were the people involved um, in, um, in building up his, um, his weapons of mass destruction. Um, a lot of this came out afterwards, uh, after the uh, first Gulf War, but um, it, there were still many questions to be asked. Um, as a young reporter, I would occasionally get called by either the Iraqis or the Iranians, and on this case, it was the Iranians, saying, would you like to come to Tehran? Uh, it was always with a mixed, it was always a mixed blessing. I was very interested in the story, but um, with the Iranians, whenever you went out there, they would say, we will take you to the front. And um, you'd say, OK, but um, you know, what's, you know, what's going on in the front? Never mind, you know, if you die, you'll go to heaven. And you know, so that was a, a popular theme when you were being flown in a rickety helicopter uh, uh, to, the, to the front line. In this case, uh, we were in the final throes of the war, um, arrived in um, Tehran, and it was a little bit like the, what I imagine, a little bit like the Blitz in London. Normally, Tehran is bumper to bumper traffic. And when we arrived, there was no traffic in the, in the city at all. The rich people had moved up to the northern suburbs, the expensive bit, and um, Scud missiles were raining down on the city from the Iraqis. Um, and the Scud, as you, some of you probably know, is not dissimilar to the V2 rocket that the Germans built. Um, so that was already um, quite a, an insight into how the conflict was going, that the Iraqis were still able to, to hit that. 
Um, we were then told that we were going to uh, be taken to the northern front, which was not usual. Usually most of the fighting happened in the southern marshes. But in this case, the Iranians had launched an offensive up in the Kurdish areas with some cooperation um, from um, Kurdish fighters on the other side of the border and had captured some areas. And we'd heard rumors and there were reports of the use of chemical weapons. But um, we got to Kerman Shah, which is a town up in the north, and um, we were put onto American, uh, Vietnam era Huey's helicopters, um, which I think said, you know, maximum 12 people, and at one point I counted about 30. Um, and these um, old helicopters sort of fought their way over the snow-capped mountains and took us to Halabsha, which I'd never heard of before. And from the air, it looked absolutely fine. I mean, there was no, you know, if you go to Grozny, you can see what happened to Grozny after a month of um, Russian artillery bombardment. Here, the roofs were fine, the glasses were in the window panes. There was no visible sign of anything going on. But of course, there were no people. I mean, I think we, we encountered maybe four or five in a town that had been populated by 70,000. So we landed, and um, we didn't have that much time on the ground because the Iraqi Air Force was still flying overhead with their MiGs. And I presume they could see, us, uh, see the helicopters on the ground. And there were a few um, Iranian Revolutionary Guards passed around who accompanied us, and some who were there, but a handful. Um, and um, we started to scout around the, the town, and we came across the most dramatic area, really, where some sort of very, very powerful nerve agent had clearly been used. Um, and uh, I can only deduce this because everything had been killed within seconds, clearly. Um, we went into somebody's house, and they'd been sitting around a table, and they were all dead by their seats. Uh, the birds and the trees were on the, on the ground, cats, you know, whatever. Um, there was a family, I remember, who had clearly decided to make a break for it, father at the wheel of a pickup truck. All the valuables and the, the children in the back and his wife next to him, and the car had swerved into a wall. So obviously, they'd all died instantaneously, and the car had just basically driven into the wall. And then we came up house after house of people who'd taken refuge in cellars, which would be the obvious thing to do if you think you're under air attack. But if you're being bombarded with a chemical weapon, that um, sinks down, then it becomes your tomb. And indeed, you know, you'd open the cellar door and you'd see a, a ring of carpets and all the other, you know, household valuables and everyone dead. Um, and then there was probably the most m memorable image, which I'm sure some of you have seen, of a man, I didn't know his name then, but we've found out since, Omar Abdullah Hussein, clutching his baby and, um, who was on the thresholds of a, a house, perhaps his or perhaps somebody else's, when he was killed. And there's a famous picture of him holding the child. And the child looks cherubic and unharmed, but obviously they both died instantaneously. Um, so we were able to put together a picture of at least you know, one sector of the, of the city, that uh, town that was, that was wiped out, and then we saw groups, clusters of other bodies around the town. Um, you know, when you're covering a war, very often you only get a little snapshot of what's happening at one particular point, one particular time. Wars happen extremely quickly, and particularly now with aircraft and all the other fast-moving types of warfare, it's often very difficult to get a full picture. And people say, well, what's really happening? You say, well, you know, from my perspective, that's what I saw. Actually, on this occasion, it's one of the rare occasions when I think I felt we had a very full picture. When we went back to Iran, they took us to a hospital where the wards were full of um, civilians um, who'd been affected mainly by mustard gas. So unlike the gas, the nerve agent that had killed the people that we saw in Halabja, these were people who'd been blinded, who had um, inhaled mustard gas, which it's called the First World War type of gas, um, which had got into their lungs. And uh, it particularly affects women and children are more susceptible to it. Um, and so we were able to interview really quite a lot of people about what they'd seen and done, which is 
pretty important because it, it, inevitably both sides will start blaming each other for, for perpetrating this thing. And it, my abiding memory was if I had been gassed and I was coughing up my last breath, I wouldn't cover up the people who'd done it and say, actually, it was um, the Iraqis when it was actually the Iranians. Um, you've got nothing to lose. <laughs> you know, you're not going to, to cover for somebody. So I thought that was compelling. And then when we got back to Iran, we met some Iraqi officers, senior officers, who told us that they'd been given um, protective gear and that they'd been ordered to use this stuff. Obviously, that's a more difficult thing because they're, they're captives and you know, maybe the Iranians forced them to say that. But certainly, it, the whole picture seemed to fit um, for what happened. And um, sometime later, when I was covering Iraq after the invasion, um, the only satisfaction I had really uh, of uh, attending one of the trials that were taking place was to see Ali Hassan al-Majid, also known as Chemical Ali, once the mastermind behind the Anfal campaign, the man who deployed these horrific weapons on behalf of Saddam, shuffle into the courtroom looking like an old and spent force. And um, unfortunately, he was never tried for Halabsha properly. And you know, it was a, I think it was a great wasted opportunity to confront the world with what had happened. But nevertheless, a form of justice was had, in my opinion. Uh, um, and um, at least he didn't get away with his crimes. Um, so um, once we'd um, completed uh, um, research and filed our stories, um, the um, uh, main foreign diplomats who were still in Tehran then, about 10 or 12, mainly Western ambassadors, but others too, asked to be briefed on what we'd seen, and I gave them what I've, broadly speaking, given, uh, discussed with you today. And um, uh, they all sent off their reports, and you know, it was fine. And uh, I thought, well, you know, for it's not often in journalism when you've been an eyewitness to history and you maybe make a contribution. And I think many of us felt the same way. Um, unfortunately, um, as, almost as soon as we got back to London, the counter-propaganda campaign started. Uh, the Pentagon came out with a thing saying this had to be an Iranian uh, attack because only they use cyanide gas or something. Um, the British said, well, there's no conclusive proof here. Uh, and both sides continued to arm and assist Saddam Hussein. Um, and um, I'm sorry, both the British and American governments, as we discovered subsequently. Um, so there were, I would say, few lessons learnt at that stage um, from the from the events that um, that we saw, um, and um, that that remained, of course, until Saddam invaded Kuwait, and then suddenly um, he was the um, public enemy number one, and all the stuff was revisited, and um, his attempt to ethnically cleanse Kurdistan led obviously to the intervention of the Americans and the Brits. And the only good that came out of this was that Kurdistan succeeded in building itself up into a modern, successful, uh, autonomous region, which if any of you have been there recently, will, you'll be absolutely staggered by what's been achieved. And it's still thriving to this day. Um, in conclusion, I would just say this, that I'm not at all satisfied that what happened um, in northern Iraq could not happen again. Um, and um, I completely understand why people are against humanitarian intervention and all this sort of stuff. But if you look at the situation in Syria today with a regime heavily armed but with its back up against the wall, I could envision scenarios where they might be tempted to use chemical weapons. 70,000 people have been killed in the last two years, and to my knowledge, hardly sanctioned against Assad. Um, there's, there's no attempt to arrest him as a war criminal or anything like that. They've started to use SCUDs in quite large numbers against heavily populated civilian areas, with people being killed in their hundreds. Um, these are huge, huge weapons, you know, so uh, 
length, take out you know, a whole street. And if you look at what Saddam tried to do, which is basically ethnically cleanse areas, there is no better weapon than chemical weapons. They're not very good against sophisticated armies because they can, take, they can protect themselves. But if you have an inconvenient valley populated, say, by Sunnis next to an area that you want to create as an enclave for, say, the Alawites, which is the ruling um, group in um, Syria, a single chemical bomb, uh, even the threat of one, would be enough to drive out the whole population. And that could be the end game in Syria. And it's really important, I think, that the West, particularly the United States, and us, don't just wring our hands, but actually send a very powerful signal that this is, you know, we're not just talking um, uh, hypothetically, that uh, this is an absolute red line. And even before then, I think we ought to be thinking about taking actions like, you know, no-fly zones and safe havens and all, all that sort of stuff. And if you stand up to people, then they tend to back down. And, you know, it's too late probably to save Syria, but it might not be too late to, to stop another Halabsha. Thank you very much. When Halabja uh, was attacked, warnings were not given, uh, and people were surprised uh, and, and caught unprepared. The houses were not ones that are in any way airtight, um, and chemical weapons are dispersed either as a gas or as an aerosol. Uh, that's like a sort of a, a spray, a fine spray, and they blow down wind. Uh, and so the release of bombs uh, or shells uh, will create an immediate problem, but then people downwind will be affected as well. The Iraqis never owned up to the use of chemical weapons. And to this day, we don't know what was used in Halabja. All we know um, is that those who died, died from something that was very potent. Uh, and it would fit what we know about the chemical nerve agent, sarin. There, were, there was an estimate of some 5,000 deaths. We also know uh, from many of the victims that they had injuries consistent with mustard gas exposure. And indeed, some of the people who were subsequently examined in the West uh, had evidence of the breakdown products of mustard gas in urine uh, and in blood. At the time of the Halabja attack, the Iraqis uh, were denying that they'd used anything, uh, and there was no uh, evidence at all about it. A colleague of mine, uh, Gwyn Roberts, who many of you will know, um, was a frequent visitor to Iraq, and he went into uh, northern Iraq, and he collected a number of soil samples, some a sample of wool, uh, and also um, uh, some soil, uh, and a little bit uh, of a bomb. I won't go through all of these uh, products in detail, but Gwyn returned with them, uh, and he asked me to help get these analyzed. Uh, and I organized for a commercial laboratory uh, to do some work, uh, and the chemical defense establishment in Porton Down uh, also worked on the samples. And essentially, we found that uh, they were, um, the samples contained, some of them contained mustard gas, others contained breakdown products of mustard gas. Thiodiglycol is a hydrolysis product. It might also be involved in the formation uh, of the mustard gas. But the dithion and oxythion, these are combustion products produced when mustard, a mustard gas bomb explodes. And the other uh, element, tetral, is an explosive which would cause a munition to explode. So this was published in 1990 in an American uh, medical journal. And then uh, I was involved in a second uh, piece of work. And this was um, soil samples collected by a human Rights Watch and Physicians for Human Rights in northern Iraq. And this was four years after the bombs had been uh, dropped. Uh, the 
physicians were working in a village, um, exhuming uh, bodies to rebury them, they what they wanted to do, given the Anfal campaign and millions of people on the move, was try and reconstruct what had happened to one small village uh, and 70 odd people, uh, and in so doing, try and bring it to a more human scale so that more people would understand the problems that the Iraqis had uh, experienced, the, the Iraqi Kurds. While they were doing this, they were told about this village uh, further up in the mountains that had been attacked. They went there, there were four bomb craters, and they sampled from the four of them. They took soil samples from the craters themselves. And that's important. And these, these samples were brought back. Um, they were under somebody's care all the time. We had what's called a chain of custody. And I was asked to try and organize for them to be analyzed. I negotiated with Port and Down. Uh, they were very keen to do the work. The Ministry of Defense was less keen, so it took us three months to try and sort that out. But eventually, uh, it was organized. And then um, Robin Black at Port and Down was involved in doing the uh, analysis. Uh, this slide won't go on. Um, and I'll show you the results in a moment. And what we decided to do when we had the information uh, was to do a joint press conference, and I fronted one in Washington, and the director of Port and Down did that in the UK. And basically what we wanted to do was send a message that even four years after these things have been used, if you sample in the right places, uh, you will find uh, material uh, that is um, uh, confirmatory of the use of these agents. So these were two uh, lots of samples from the field that indicated that chemical agents had indeed uh, been used. Now, the majority of the victims and the estimates are in the region of about 12,000 um, had mustard gas injuries. And mustard gas is what is called vesicant. It, it causes blisters, vesicles in other words. And this is very characteristic of someone who's had a, a moderate uh, exposure to mustard gas. You get these large blisters. They tend to develop about 24 hours after exposure. Um, and these blisters may subsequently burst and you get uh, skin damage. It may be relatively uh, minor, the damage, or it could be full thickness through the skin. It might repair of its own accord or it might require some kind of skin graft. But the early signs are ones which occur in the eyes. Uh, and this is a, an Iranian um, victim, uh, mustard gas, um, starts to cause the eyes to feel very gritty and sore. It's almost as if you've got sand in your eyes. Um, and this uh, effect starts to occur from about half an hour to a few hours after exposure. Um, eventually, the eyes will become very sore, uh, but they become edematous. So the eyelids swell uh, and they close. And you may have seen some very famous pictures from the First World War of soldiers being led off the battlefield unable to see. It's because the eyelids swell and they close, uh, and it's very, very frightening for people. Um, they think they're going blind. Uh, and um, there was a young um, Iraqi Kurd, this is a 15-year-old girl who I saw in hospital in 1988 in the UK. There were five um, uh, Kurdish um, civilians who were sent to the UK uh, for treatment. You can see with this girl that there's not a lot uh, to show for her injury. She had no external um, blisters or burns. Um, the only damage uh, that you can see that's visible is some burns around the mouth. Her eyes are, of course, uh, painful uh, and, and closed, but most of her damage uh, was internal. It was an effect on her lungs. I'm pleased to say that she survived, as indeed all did, did, did all the five uh, that I saw, uh, and that they were all treated uh, in the UK. This is another young uh, Kurdish man, um, and uh, um, he was a, a young student. And this lady, move, slide, oops, sorry. This lady would only say that she was a grandmother. Um, they all agreed to me filming. This is not a very dignified photograph, um, but she was very concerned uh, 
that her injuries be visible and be seen by others. Uh, and um, she didn't tell me her age. I didn't ask her age. She just said that um, she was a grandmother uh, and over 50. And you can see that uh, her arm uh, is bandaged. She's got a very severe uh, burn on her arm and, and one uh, on her side. This is a very characteristic effect of mustard gas. It uh, affects the cells that produce melanin. So it's the, the same sort of effect of a lot of sunlight. So you get exposure to mustard gas and you get this characteristic tanning. And you can see where this individual is exposed. It's almost as if someone's drawn a line down his, his, his skin and down his abdomen. On the um, top, if there's a pointer here, yes. you can see here this area is very severely ulcerated. He would have had a huge blister uh, and that subsequently burst uh, and um, ulcerated. He was one of some 30 uh, Iranians that I saw between 1984 and 88 uh, in the UK. This is an effect of peeling. Once mustard gas causes this tanning, it's just like you've been exposed to too much sun and then hoping you'll hang on to your tan, um, but the skin then peels. And the peeling process um, here is not painful. And indeed, there are some recommendations, some clinicians would advocate removal of this skin with some sort of dermal abrasion uh, to then hasten the sort of the, the healing process. These, most of the soldiers who came to the UK also survived, but two of them died, and they were very severely uh, exposed. Mustard gas tends to only kill about 2% of those who are exposed to it, and these are figures both from the Iraq-Iran War and from the First World War. So in some view, some minds, it's more of a sort of an incapacitating agent. And believe me, it does incapacitate. These are pretty, these are horrendous uh, uh, images uh, and injuries. But they're not the end of the story. Um, the Iranians at the moment have a cohort of some 30,000 individuals who were exposed in the Iraq-Iran war, and they are still requiring treatment. Uh, and most of those are from mustard-related injuries. Many of them have respiratory complaints. So mustard gas will damage the respiratory tract. Uh, you may get, because it, it caused blistering and damage to the tissue, um, it then leaves the uh, respiratory tract vulnerable to infection, uh, and infections may occur. But it also causes damage to the bone marrow, uh, and the bone marrow then gets suppressed. You get a reduction in your white, cell your white cell count. You may get a reduction in the red cells and platelets, so individuals are more likely to bleed. And certainly with a reduction in the white cell count, they're much more vulnerable to infections. And that's what usually kills people. So those who have died from mustard gas injuries usually die, I mean, it's after several days at the earliest, but it can be up to a month after uh, exposure. The individuals the Iranians are, are treating have um, what would call, you call COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So they've got uh, emphysema, they've got chronic bronchitis, some of them have asthma, uh, and um, some have a, another condition uh, um, which is, causes significant damage uh, to the lungs, very like uh, an emphysema type condition. And I saw one of these, or two of these individuals with lung injuries in 2006 when I was in Tehran. Also distressing is the fact that although eyes recover after about a month, the grittiness disappears, there's no um, antidote for mustard gas. It's, the treatment is all, pro is all symptomatic. So you just basically treat the symptoms and you try and minimize the pain uh, and give salves uh, for the skin and wash the eyes and so on. Um, there is, for some reason, as yet unexplained, 
um, a problem in some individuals who suddenly develop a sort of, it's called a keratin, keratin, keratinitis. It's a sort of, it's almost like a significant scarring in the eyes. Uh, and there's an, a late onset blindness in a number of individuals. So whatever the mustard gas is doing, it's causing this late onset problem. So people, are, their vision is, appears to be normal uh, and then all of a sudden deteriorates. And I also saw one man um, who had skin injuries uh, and he lifted his shirt and it was as if someone had had finger paints on their, on their fingers uh, and all over his skin there were these pale-like uh, fingerprints, um, and it was areas of the skin that had no pigmentation, and it was areas where the mustard gas had affected the skin, and that individual had scarring. Now, when you scar, uh, it just means that your pores are no longer working. I mean, it's just flat, um, transparent skin, a bit like plastic, uh, and it causes such itchiness. And this man had become, well, he hadn't become, he had been suicidal and he had made several attempts on his own life because of the itchiness. It was just so awful. So this legacy uh, with mustard it, um, is very apparent amongst the uh, Iranians uh, and it will be there with the Kurdish group uh, as well. This is just to uh, emphasize what Richard said. Um, that people died, obviously, um, almost where they were exposed or when they were trying to get away. The estimate is about 5,000 deaths. Um, must, the nerve agent that was used, um, if it was sarin, um, would fit this particular picture. There's no evidence that a cyanide bomb was used. Um, nerve agents cause, have an effect on breathing. And if the breathing is restricted severely, uh, because you can't breathe, individuals become cyanosed. Uh, and so you can see you know, their fingernails will look bluish. Um, so the exposure to a nerve agent would explain some of the appearances uh, of, of bodies. Um, the, the, the damage was very marked. Um, there is no evidence um, that the Iranians who, or the, as far as I'm aware, the Kurds who were exposed to any nerve agents and survived have long-term injuries. It's possible that you could get long-term long injuries with a sort of delayed damage to the nervous system, a delayed uh, onset neuropathy, uh, and maybe some other conditions but the Iranians don't report this uh, in their cohorts of uh, injured individuals. So um, Halabja was a hallmark, if you like, in the discussions on chemical weapons. There had been discussions going on for many years in Geneva to try and get a comprehensive chemical weapons treaty that involved a policing element, and Patricia referred to the Chemical Weapons Convention, and this was agreed in 1993. There was an earlier um, treaty that was agreed, and this was after the First World War, the 1925 Geneva Convention, but that has no policing provisions. The 1993 um, Chemical Weapons Convention does have these policing provisions. Uh, and Halabja was one of those um, historical incidents that gave added momentum um, to those discussions because here was clear evidence that it wasn't just soldiers in the field that were going to be the victims. It was an unprotected civilian population uh, and there clearly uh, was a need um, to have some uh, important uh, treaty uh, and that treaty exists now. 188 countries have signed it. Uh, and it's working well, and as Patricia said, countries are getting, some countries have got rid of their chemical weapons stocks, the two major ones, the United States uh, and Russia, who inherited the stocks from the Soviet Union, are getting rid of their stocks. It'll probably be a few more years before they're all destroyed completely, but they're on track, they're inspected, it's openly uh, examined by an inspectorate that uh, is based in The Hague, uh, and as far as we uh, can see, the Chemical Weapons Treaty is working very well. Um, and regrettably, Halabja was one of the things that helped to force it into being. Uh, 
Um, so if there's one positive legacy, and it's difficult to say positive, uh, it's that we have a treaty that hopefully will prevent other people being exposed under similar circumstances. Thank you. I'd like to thank Chatham House for hosting uh, an event to mark the anniversary of the attack on Halabja. Uh, I think it's uh, very heartening for the people of Kurdistan that uh, this is taking place. And I thank both Alistair and Richard for their very powerful uh, presentation, so very hard act to follow. Um, I think what I will do is, if I may, is put the attack on Halabja within the context of what was happening in Iraq and the context of the genocide. And then I would like to touch on what I think are the lessons uh, that we should have learnt from the use of poison gas in Iraq. The attack on Halabja happened in March uh, 1988. But in fact, the genocide against the Kurds in Iraq began as early as the 60s. Some would say even earlier than that. But it's generally accepted that in the early 60s, the genocide on the Iraqi Kurds began. It began with the Arabization around Kirkuk. As you know, Kirkuk is now a disputed area between the Kurds and the Arabs in Iraq and the Turkmen and Christians. Um, and we're often accused of only wanting or being interested in Kirkuk because of the oil, which is not the case. Um, from our perspective, Kirkuk is historically, geographically, culturally, linguistically Kurdish. Um, and the discovery of oil happened later. But anyway, Kirkuk unfortunately became the, the first stage of what eventually became part of genocide. Of course, at that stage, uh, we, we didn't really realize where it's going to head. So in the 1960s, you had the Arabization program, the beginnings of the genocide operation. In the 1970s, it was stepped up. The Faili Kurds, Faili Kurds are Shia Kurds, Kurds of the Shia faith. Um, they were targeted. Uh, Saddam accused them of being agents of Iran because they were Shia and uh, sent thousands and thousands uh, to their deaths, um, deported, as he described it, deported many of them to Iran, but in fact they just disappeared. Uh, to this day, we don't know what happened to them. Uh, so that was in the late 70s and 80s. In 1983, in one operation, 8,000 men and boys from the Barzani clan disappeared, boys as young as 12, uh, they were considered uh, of battle age, so they were rounded up. Uh, some were buried alive. There's evidence that uh, some of them were buried alive, uh, and we're finding the mass graves. Um, well, even now, we're finding the mass graves. Um, then, So this was in 1983. Then you get into the late 80s, 1987-88, which was, I would say, the peak of the genocide. And this was called the Anfal operation by Saddam Hussein. Anfal is a verse from the Quran uh, which refers to the spoils of war. So uh, don't forget that this was uh, during the period of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, so what happened in the Anfal campaign, uh, which was meticulously organized and executed, uh, sec sector by sector or district by district, uh, parts of Kurdistan were attacked with chemicals. Villages were razed to the ground, completely destroyed. Wells were poisoned. People were rounded up and taken into uh, what were called collectives, but effectively they were concentration camps. People were taken south to notorious prisons, um, such as Nugra Salman, where many perished just from uh, the disgusting conditions where they lived in which they lived. Um, so the Anfal operation uh, campaign, excuse me, had eight stages. And as I said, it was meticulously planned. If you look at a map, you will see that it started towards the eastern Kurdish border, so the border with Iran. And it moved up and up and up and eventually ended in Badinan, which is more towards the northern part of Iraqi Kurdistan, towards Turkey. Um, and 
women and children were separated from men. Um, some were taken to huge, uh, notorious dungeons such as Nugra Salman, uh, and others just disappeared, and we're finding the mass graves today. Uh, in the genocide campaign from about 1976 to 1988, four and a half thousand villages were destroyed. And Kurdistan was a very rural, agriculture-based society. This, so this was an attempt to destroy the fabric of our society, to destroy our culture. Um, and we had about 5,000 villages, so effectively almost all of our villages were destroyed. Uh, there was an order to shoot on site anybody who was seen to be farming or to be on their farmlands. So the result of this was that uh, one or two generations of farmers were lost, and now we're struggling to revive our agriculture sector and to encourage people to go back to the land. And Kurdistan was the breadbasket of Iraq at one point. And in fact, I think in the 50s, Kurdistan uh, was uh, one of the exporters of wheat to Britain. Um, so the villages were destroyed, people were sent to concentration camps, notorious prisons, or simply to their deaths. The Anfal campaign itself, just in those eight months or so of 1988, uh, killed 182,000 people. Uh, nobody really knows the true number of people who were killed over the, deca the decades of the genocide. So, Halabja actually wasn't part of the Anfal campaign, even though it happened during that time. It wasn't part of the planned Anfal operation. It was a one-off extra operation by Saddam Hussein. What happened in Halabja, in fact, is that um, in the days running up to the chemical attack, there were aerial t attacks through normal conventional weapons. Uh, so what we believed happened is that the conventional weapons were used, um, windows, doors were broken, and maybe this made it easier for the chemicals to enter the houses, I don't know. Uh, and then this was followed by the chemical attack. And as you saw from Alistair's pictures and from uh, heard from Richard and his eyewitness account, uh, people were killed in their uh, cellars, in their shelters. Many were killed trying to escape. Uh, people thought that if they went into a river or a stream, they might be saved, but many were not. Others who were injured fled to Iran. Halabja is on the Iranian border. And Iran and Turkey both uh, helped and took refugees. But unfortunately, the refugees were still not safe. Uh, Saddam chemically bombed refugee camps in Iran and refugees who had taken shelter in Turkey found that the bread of the local bakery had also been poisoned. So even the refugees were not safe. So what are the consequences for us today in, in Iraq and in Kurdistan? Well, we as a regional government are probably the only or perhaps one of a few governments around the world that has a genocide ministry. We have a ministry for Anfal and Martyr Affairs. Um, and this is because we have so many widows, we have so many families with no male relatives left. We have families that have been completely wiped out. We have many orphans. Uh, we have many people with um, injuries that Frankly, our healthcare system doesn't have the know-how to deal with. And we have areas that uh, we believe are still toxic. Uh, so we need a, chemical, uh, a, a, a genocide ministry to deal with all of that, to deal with the families who need pensions and stipends to survive. Um, and part of the work of the ministry is indeed to raise awareness of the genocide and to call for international recognition of the genocide. And this is one of the, the things that we've been working on a great deal in Britain um, 
uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the all-party parliamentary group in the British Parliament, uh, the all-party parliamentary group on the Kurdistan region, which has been working very hard to raise awareness of the genocide, and it's thanks to them and to the petition that we have a debate on the recognition of the genocide on Thursday. Um, the consequences, I think, outside of Kurdistan and Iraq, well, I'm pleased to hear Alastair say that perhaps Halabja made a contribution towards the treaty that was signed in 1993. I think recognition, international recognition of the genocide will go a long way to helping the victims. I think compensation and justice will help the victims. Iraq itself has recognized the genocide. Um, there were trials in Baghdad, and there were four cases that were recognized as genocide. The Anfal campaign, Halabja, the disappearance of the Barzanis, and the attack on the Faili Shia Kurds. Uh, but there, there are so many who have blood on their hands in Iraq, um, and they haven't faced justice. And what about the foreign companies, the European and other companies that armed Saddam Hussein, and they knew what they were doing? Uh, maybe there are governments that were complicit. We don't know, but all of that needs to be investigated. And sometimes people ask me, uh, why is it that 20 now, 25 years have passed and the Kurds haven't really done very much about the genocide internationally? It's a good question. And I think that one of the reasons is that we're just so close to the trauma that we can't face it. And it's very, very difficult. And maybe we need the distance of that time for us to be able to deal with it. Um, maybe we need to look at what happened with the Holocaust, because I believe that the Holocaust wasn't really talked about <coughs> for a good 20 or 30 years after it happened. Uh, but we, our generation, forgets that, because it's, it's a given that Holocaust was a, was a genocide. Um, there's so much to talk about, but I know time is short, so I would really like to talk about the, the lessons. I think one of the lessons should be nip it in the bud. When you see signs of genocide, when you see signs or alarms of chemical weapons being used or stockpiled, the international community, the United Nations, should do something about it. And, you know, I'm alarmed uh, that in Syria, in December, Agent 15 was used. Um, Hamish kindly gave me the name of that uh, chemical that was used. It's not classed as a chemical according to the convention. But as I understand it, it's, some, it's something that incapacitates people for five to ten minutes, allowing whatever needs to happen to then happen, you know, security forces to move in or, or whatever. But we should all be alarmed by this because, as I said, the genocide in Iraqi Kurdistan didn't start on a massive scale. It started with small little steps being taken here and there. Nobody took any action. Then the regime becomes emboldened more and more to the point where you reach 1988 and there's a huge operation in the space of eight months. Two and a half thousand villages are destroyed. Four and a half thousand were destroyed over two decades. But in eight months, two and a half thousand were destroyed and 182,000 people are killed or disappear. So nip it in the bud and we are all responsible for that. I don't, I don't accept that we should leave everything to the UN. We are the UN. The UN represents all of us, represents you. Do something about it. I think we should ask why any country needs to have a stockpile of chemical weapons. We should, they should be forced to get rid of them. So I think that's another thing that's incumbent on all of us, whoever we are, uh, but especially on the politicians and our leaders to do something about this. I think we should also ask ourselves, countries that have a record or a history of genocide, mass slaughter, attacking their own people, like Iraq, like Syria, uh, 
and I'm sure there are many, many other examples. These countries should be asked, why do you need certain weapons? Why do you need chemicals? We Kurds are very alarmed, for example, that America is planning to sell F-16 jets to uh, the Iraqi government. Why does Iraq need F-16 jets? Really, we should ask ourselves that. So, my, my lessons, my, the lessons that I have learned, and I'm sure there are many more and we will hear from you, but nip it in the bud. Ask, why do you need these chemical weapons? Why does anybody need them in, in stockpile? And then countries that have a record should have a stronger policing and be under greater scrutiny. Again, I would like to thank Chatham House for hosting this. I sincerely thank them. It's not a, just a, a speaker thanking you. I thank you as a Kurd and as a speaker. And I would like to thank Alistair and Richard because I think what they say uh, backs what people like me say. I'm a Kurd, maybe I have a stake in, in saying this, but they don't. And I think what they say is more important than what people like me say. Thank you.